460. Let's stand and sing. Leaning on the everlasting arm. 460. trying to rush to get over here, 
I saw all these people fishing out here. Some of you mentioned this about putting speakers out here as we have our preaching service. And I thought, well, we can't really do that. But you remember back when we had the drive through services and we had to listen on the radio? I still got all that stuff. Now, I don't want to make it easy for someone to miss church because if we end up, if I put that on the radio, put service on the radio, and put a sign out there that they can listen to the services that's going on over here, some people are like, oh, man, I can fish and listen to go to church, too, at the same time. Well, they're going to be hearing that they shouldn't be over there, and they should be in here. So, uh, But I thought, you know, hey, if that's going to get somebody saved or get somebody in the church that you know otherwise been skipping and not been doing what they should, uh, that might be a possibility. I'm not, not going to pull the trigger on that yet, but just praying about it. So if you'd pray about that with me. And, uh, you know, we just, we're in crazy days. We're just in crazy times. And, and things, it would be nice. I like the way it used to be where you just, you knew what to expect. And you just kind of, you, you were doing well with things. But now it's just like there's so many things uh, we've had to adjust. Uh, you know, COVID kind of shook us all out of our norm. And, uh, but a lot of things we've had to adjust since then. But that's okay. We'll just go where God uh, guides and where he leads us. Uh, and then continue, too, I think I'm going to do that thing with the question box. I mentioned that this morning. Uh, and if we can find a little box with a lid, you know, slide a card down in, or somebody wants to, I don't know if you can make a shoe box or something, just cut a little hole out, put that in there. We can use that. Uh, but anyway, you don't have to put your name on the card. If you have a question, then it might be something the Lord uses to, uh, you know, I might not preach a whole message, but I might cover a part of the message uh, to try to help you out. And try to answer some of those questions. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Brother Harper, don't forget, he is up this week at Preacher John's Church. So if you'd like to go up there sometime and hear him, I know uh, he would enjoy seeing you. And uh, be an encouragement there to the church as uh, you know, they have some more folks show up there for services. And then um, there are a few dates in the bulletin. The, the next thing coming up is Time Change Sunday, and that is March 12th, so it's Saturday to so the 13th, or let's see, the 11th is Saturday, the 12th is Sunday, so uh, what we'll do, of course, we move our clocks forward, we spring forward, so we lose that extra hour, but the good news is it gets dark later, so that's the wonderful thing about the time change, and uh, hopefully sometime they just permanently fix that. But uh, that's all the announcements I have right now. So let's all stand. Let's welcome one another to our service. And then we'll prepare for our Sunday night off.
that means, and I've been in churches that's done this too, when they sing that chorus, it says, wave the answer back to heaven. Everyone gets their Bible and you wave, wave the answer back to heaven. By his grace we will. And uh, I thought, well, you know, some people might think we're getting a little on the charismatic side. And we might get somebody running down the aisle or something. I don't know. But now, it's, it's not a problem to do that in churches. We had a song leader years ago. And uh, there, I can't remember what the name of the song was, but he would always, when we sing this chorus, he would turn around in the congregation, sing the chorus, and it's something about lift your hands to heaven. And he would always go like, he was all about you know, getting everybody's hands up to heaven. Of course, I was a little Baptist rebel. I'm just sitting there going like this. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll raise my hands if the Holy Spirit moves me. So, and uh, but yeah, it's it's just funny how you go through different experiences in church. Um, well, we have any young people have any Bible memory verses? We got a few coming on up. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Very good. service and praise the Lord for that and uh, we want God to be all forward for those things. Amen. Sometimes you know people will just, it might have been somebody was saved and they just you know, needed some reassurance you never know but uh, that's a, just a tremendous time to get the gospel out is a uh, you know, funeral service so glad to be able to have a part in that. Anybody else? Alright good. We have a special event? <coughs> okay. Alright well we'll go ahead and have our special then. Ladies on song. Ladies on song. Come on up.
the woman. There's some different speculation as far as who this woman is. And uh, one of them, many people believe it's one of the Marys, and I don't have a problem with that. But uh, the story teaches us a great truth. And we know the Pharisee here is a Pharisee by the name of Simon. And Jesus points out very clearly this woman, she understood and knew just how much of a sinner she was. And that is what changed everything about her response to Jesus Christ. Now, Simon, the Pharisee, was just as much a sinner. He was just as wicked. The only problem is he didn't realize it. So the question I have for you tonight here is, do you love much or do you love little? Let's pray and we'll get into the message. Our Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures. And I pray that you will open our hearts and understanding now and help us, Lord, to uh, see this simple truth here. And help us to think about it throughout the week. Uh, because, Lord, we all need to realize that if it wasn't for your grace, your grace has kept us from a lot of sin. It has kept us from a lot of things that our flesh would do. In our flesh dwells no good thing. We are all as an unclean thing, and we would all be doing such abominable things. Things that just seem unseemly that we hear about in the news in our day and time. That is what we are all capable of. But if it wasn't for your grace, Lord, that would be us. We would go that same way. And so, Father, we thank you for your love. And we pray that you help us to be appreciative of that love, that we might love you much. In Christ's name we ask these things. Amen. Well, Jesus says something interesting here in verse 47. He basically says that somebody who has been forgiven much loves much. But somebody who has been forgiven a little Loves little. Now, this is not really talking about the quantity of their sins. You've been like I have. You've heard some testimonies over the years as people would stand up in church and give their testimony. And, and uh, as you're sitting there, if you grew up in a Christian home and you basically were you know, dragged to church your whole life and, and uh, you made to come and made to go to Sunday school, and you have not experienced probably a lot of things that some people have experienced. And you hear some people give testimonies how God saved them out of drugs and alcohol and they were on the street and they were homeless and God rescued them. And you hear some tremendous testimonies and oftentimes if we're not careful, we think, man, what a tremendous testimony that is. I wish I had a testimony like that. Well, I'm here to tell you, you do have a testimony like that. Because if it wasn't for God's grace, that would be you. You see, we have to realize what our flesh is capable of. And Simon here was in a position where he didn't realize just how wicked and vile his flesh was. He was very comfortable with where he was at in life. He was one of the religious crowd there, the Pharisees, and they would all gather around and people would look at them as being the spiritual leaders. But the more we realize just how wicked and vile our heart is, our heart is deceitful, the Bible says, and desperately wicked. When we understand that truth, we have a much greater appreciation for the love of God and the forgiveness of God. And that's what this woman experienced here in this passage. Now, I want you to see a couple other stories here. This is not a three-point outline. This is not, you know, boom, 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 this and that. It's just a thought I want to try to drive home to you. So the first place I want you to turn, we're going to be back here in Luke 7 at the end in just a second. So turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 8. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8, and hold your place there, and then turn to Mark chapter 5. Now there's one other passage, we're not going to look at this passage, that these, the passage in Matthew 8 and Mark chapter 5, and also in Luke chapter 8, these are what we call parallel passages. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are known as the synoptic gospels. They go hand in hand, they often tell a lot of the same stories, but they fill in different details because they're looking at it from a different perspective. And you sometimes can't get the whole story until you read the account in all three places. Now, before we look at Matthew 8, I want you to see the passage here in Mark chapter 5. This is the demoniac of Gadara. Now, we've been preaching on Wednesday night about angels. Uh, I covered this past Wednesday about uh, you know, demons, Beelzebub and his demons, his devils, and uh, how we can protect ourselves from demonic attack, and uh, how we can recognize 
uh, demonic influence. And the devil's going to look for any avenue that he wants to uh, get into our life. And, and there are some things that, I mean, they sell stuff on a toy store. You, you see them, there are some things in uh, a lot of Disney movies are going to have these types of themes. And you have to be very careful when you say, oh, Disney movies? Yes, Disney movies. I'm telling you, the devil's very deceitful with what he does. And he yeah. tried, he's so very subtle. Yeah. And uh, in some, if I was to name some cartoons before you now, uh, you would be shocked if I told you what was in those cartoons, that if you've seen them and you had your children see them, you probably watched it and went completely unnoticed. But it's really some adult theme type stuff in these cartoons. Yeah. And uh, you have to be careful. We have to have our guard up. That's why the Bible says be diligent. Yeah. That's what it means. We need to be awake. We need to be alert. We need to be diligent. So in Mark chapter 5, we see the demoniac here of Gadara. And I'm not going to get into all the things that he's doing and, and all these different things. We've covered this a little bit on Wednesday night. But I want to read the passage here to you as we go. It says here in verse 1, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Now, this is interesting here. We see in verse 4 and 5, this guy is in a lot of emotional pain, but he's also in a lot of physical pain. He is being tormented like nobody else is being tormented. And listen to what it says here in verse number 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the Most High God? Now this is the demons speaking here. He says, I endure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now this is what's coming out of this guy's mouth, but these are the demons speaking here. This guy is already tormented by these demons. And these demons are begging and pleading that Jesus not torment them the same way they're tormenting this poor man. It goes on here in verse 8. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Now some people have speculated there was probably about 10,000 demons in this one individual. That's what Legion means. It's a lot of, lot of people. And you will find out there were at least 2,000 here in just a minute. So it goes on verse 10. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that's the pigs, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. They were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. So we know there were at least 2,000 demons because there were 2,000 pigs. Okay? And they and they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. Here's the change that this made. And he that had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Now that's an interesting phrase to me because they weren't afraid before. This guy is cutting himself. He's crying mm -hmm. out in the tombs. The people, they try to put chains on him. He's breaking the chains. They weren't afraid of that. But now they're afraid. It's interesting to me. Verse 16, And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him depart out of their coast. And when he was coming to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Now this is the guy who had been healed. He had the demons cast out of him. The thing that he is begging and pleading with Jesus is, please let me just be with you. He just wants to be with Jesus. This guy loved the Lord. He was thankful for what God had done in his life. And Jesus says this here in verse 19, Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed. He was obedient. He departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Now, we're going to be back in this story in just a second, but there's only one verse I want you to look at in Matthew chapter 8. This is a parallel passage here to the story. 
So in chapter Mark chapter 5, and the same thing in Luke chapter 8, we only see, and we didn't look at the passage in Luke 8, but we only see there was one man who this had happened to. But in Matthew chapter 8, look if you would in verse 28. It says, And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs, exceeding fears, so that no man might pass by that way. And then if you read on down to the end of the chapter, you're going to see a very similar story of what just took place. But the one thing we see that's different is in Matthew chapter 8, there were two individuals that were possessed with all these demons. In Mark, in Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8, we only see one individual, and there's a reason we only see the one individual. There's a reason the attention and focus in Mark 5 and Luke 8 is only on this one individual. And here's the reason. It's because of the change it made in his life. It's what he did afterwards. That is where the attention is drawn in the story. And that is mentioned in both Luke chapter 8 and also in Mark chapter 5. That this man, he couldn't keep his mouth closed. He was so thankful to be with Jesus. He wanted to be with Jesus all the time. And Jesus said, no, I want you to go out. I want you to publish this. Tell your friends. Tell your family. And he went out and did this. And we're going to see a change that not only was taking place in his life but in the lives of many others. you know why? Because this man loved much. This man was appreciative. The other guy, we don't know much about him. I would say the demons were cast out of him as well, but he's out of the picture now. You remember the, the story of the, two, of the ten lepers that were cleansed? And Jesus healed the ten lepers, and they all left, and then there was one, only one, that came back to basically say thank you. And Jesus asked, he says, were there not ten of you? Where are the other nine? You see, there was one who loved much because he realized what had happened to him. The other nine were probably thankful, but they didn't love that much. They loved little. It's not that they didn't love the Lord. They were probably very thankful, but not like that one individual. It's the same situation here with the demoniac of Gadara. As you see one individual who is truly thankful for what God has done in their life and thankful for the change that was made. Now, in Mark chapter 5, we see, like I mentioned in verses 3 through 5, we see this man is in great torment. In verse 7, the demons cry out for Jesus not to torment them. And we know, again, there were at least 2,000 demons in this one individual. From Luke's account, we find that the one man, this, this individual here that we find in Mark 5, he wanted to stay with Jesus. And here's what Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 8. He says, no. Go and tell what great things have been done to you. You see, that's a testimony. Go tell what great things that God has done for you. Now, I mentioned the start of this message, we all hear different testimonies. And sometimes we hear a testimony where a guy got saved out of this or out of this situation or whatever it was. And then somebody else is like, well, I, didn't, I just got saved at a young age. And I really don't have a testimony like that. I'm here to tell you, the person who has the better testimony is the one who is the most grateful. The one who realizes the most what God actually saved him out of. One of the best testimonies I ever heard in my life is a testimony of Brother Scott Polly. Brother Scott Polly has never tasted alcohol. Ever. He's from a preacher's family. His dad's a preacher. His uncles are preachers. Uh, he just, he's got them all throughout his family. He was, grown, he was brought up in a Christian home. He got called to preach at an early age. God's hand was on him at an early age. But his lips had never touched alcohol. He had never touched drugs. He had never done a lot of things. He's been thankful to church his whole life. And as he gives his testimony, I'm sitting there going, wow. What a testimony. I don't have that type of testimony. God had to shake me up, slap me around, throw me against the wall, do everything he could to get my attention before I would come to him. Then I finally yielded and finally surrendered. Some people might hear a testimony like I have and think, wow, that's a great testimony. But I'm here to tell you, if you are thankful for what God has done in your life, and you are grateful, and you understand what God actually saved you from, you have the tremendous testimony. <laughs> I'm thankful God didn't allow me 
uh, to be dead by the time I was 25. And that was very plain to me. I wasn't in church. I wasn't in the Bible. But it was just like there was something inside of me. And of course, I was saved at this time. But I didn't understand all this that happened. But it, I knew. It was like a voice that said, you're going to be dead by the time you're 25 if you don't change something. I knew something had to change. You see, I realized what God brought me from. I realized, and I used to think, Lord, I'm so unworthy to do. I'm so unworthy to serve. I'm so unworthy to uh, just be able. And what a privilege it is to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But to be able to open the doors in church for somebody else and to be able to be a part of something, be able to teach a Sunday school class. What a privilege. Because I know this wretched man that I am. And it was God who's delivered me from the body of this death. And as Paul said, and Paul was so so thankful for what God had done in his life. He said, for I am chiefest of sinners. And he also said this, that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. I'm here to tell you, if we understand exactly where our flesh would take us, if we just let go. And, I'm, and this is why this is important for you young people. You better not make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Because your flesh will take you farther than you ever thought you would go. And it's going to keep you longer than you ever thought you would would stay. Yeah. And it's going to cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. That's what sin does. Yeah. You better realize what is in your flesh. And when you got saved, that flesh never got saved. It's still there. Yeah. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And that's even greater than your own flesh. That's God right. is able to change you and transform you. Our greatest enemy, we have three great enemies. The world, the flesh, and the devil. But our greatest enemy is not the devil. It is our own rotten flesh. That is our greatest enemy. When we understand that and realize that, and we realize what God saved us from and what he's willing to forgive us of, then we will also love much. So what are the lessons that we can learn from the story? Well, this one man, the man who uh, wanted to be with Jesus, who had the demons cast out, he obviously loved Jesus so much and was so grateful for what had been done to him that he couldn't keep quiet. I remember when I first found out the truths of what the gospel was and the, the Bible and what it said, I had a hard time keeping quiet. I thought everybody wanted to hear the same thing. So I went out and told everybody. Whether they wanted to hear, I'd be walking to class, and uh, we would have about a mile. We'd have to walk from one end of the campus back to our dorms when we went to uh, Western Tech there in Montgomery, and we'd walk all the way back to our dorms. And while we were walking, I would find somebody walking by themselves, and I would just start talking to them. Never knew the person before. Didn't, didn't know who they were. Just started talking to them. And all of a sudden, the conversation about salvation came up and started just saying, hey, if you were to die right now, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And I didn't know anything about the Bible. I was still young, still barely reading my Bible. And all I could do, I had a gospel track as this person was walking. Sometimes they didn't want to hear it. I said, well, I understand that. I used to be in your shoes, but you know what? ground's going to open up and you're going to burn in hell for all eternity. When you die, you're going to split hell wide open if you don't get saved right now. And I'm not suggesting we all talk to people like that. I'm just <laughs> here to tell you, I had a zeal without knowledge. I didn't have a lot of knowledge. But God used that stuff anyway. There were people that listened. There were people who put their faith and trust in Christ in spite of my uh, talents and abilities to be able to witness to them. But I would make sure, i say, here, in this track, this track changed my life right here. The, these, these verses right here, these things are read. These are Bible verses. And God changed my life. And I would tell them about the misery I was in and how God uh, rescued me and how he did all this stuff. And that would get their attention because misery loves company and almost everybody can relate to it. These people who look like they've got their act together. Some of the most miserable people in the world are people uh, who are uh, uh, on TV all the time. And they look like, I mean, they've got all the makeup on and they're looking all glamorous. They are so incredibly miserable. But you never know. This is why suicide rates are so high. Because they're miserable. Is this all there is? No, it's not all there is. There's a great truth we need to share with them. Do we love the Lord much? Or do we love him little? Are we thankful for what God has done in our hearts and lives? This other man who was mentioned in Matthew's gospel, Matthew's account, we don't know anything about him. Apparently he was healed as well. But that's the end of the story. He probably had a little bit of thankfulness, a little bit of love. But he wasn't like this other individual who made a difference. What kind of difference did this guy make? Look, if you would, in Mark chapter 5. And look at the end of the, the chapter here, Mark chapter 5. Okay. 
in verse number, uh, after Jesus says, go home to thy friends, in verse 19, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. Listen to what he does. He obeys, he departed, and began to publish in the Decapolis. Now, you don't see this name of the city mentioned in Luke's gospel. You see that he went back and he told it in his city. But this name, the Capitalist, is not the name of the city he went to. The Capitalist actually means ten cities. He went to his city and reached his city for Christ, and then it spread like wildfire and went to another city and another city and another city and another city. You know why? Because this man had a story to tell, and he was thankful for what God had done in his life. He loved the Lord much. And there were ten cities that were influenced and impacted because of this one man's testimony. Now go back, if you would, to Luke chapter 7 as we wrap this up to our story we started with, with the Pharisee and this woman who was wiping Jesus' feet with her hair and the tears she shed from her eyes. Now you may not have a lot of emotional things that happen to you in life because emotions don't mean you get saved. Emotions don't mean that you surrender to the Lord. You can have emotions. You can come forward in the service and you can cry and say, oh, you know, God, please forgive me. I'll surrender everything to you. You can do that, but you may come and not have any emotions at all, and you just may do business with the Lord. I remember my brother-in-law, when uh, he first surrendered to Christ, and uh, we've been praying for salvation for a long time. He got saved, but he just wasn't growing in the Lord. He wasn't uh, he was faithful to the church, but he just wasn't completely surrendered to the Lord. And we had a guy come in, I think it was uh, Brian McBride, if I remember correctly, who came in and he preached about fathers and the influence on their sons. Now, my brother-in-law had an oldest boy. Uh, I think he was about maybe 10 or 11 at the time. And uh, and then they had a little girl, uh, a couple years younger than that, and that was all they had. And they sat up here on the second pew in the front of the church, and we sat on the second pew over here on, in the church, and then everybody just kind of filed in behind. But I remember as that guy preached and the invitation was given, all I remember seeing, you know, you're just kind of, it's a very somber moment, very quiet moment, and, you know, you're ready to do business with the Lord. All I remember seeing as I saw his hand go over like this, grab his son's arm, jerked him out of the pew, and, I mean, he was just like, took him forward to the altar, and I thought, good night, what did he do? I thought he was in some big trouble because... Yeah, there was a few times we had to take our kids out of the service, but we never took them to the altar. <laughs> He's like, man, what in the world did you do? And, uh, but while he was up there praying, of course, you know, we're like good Baptists. We have our heads bowed and our eyes closed, and we're going, <laughs> kind of peeking, seeing what's happening. And he's up there just pouring his heart out to God. And then uh, the preacher came down and dealt with him. And what was taking place, and of course, I saw my nephew there, and he's just going, he didn't know what was happening. He didn't know what was taking place. But what was happening was God was speaking to my brother-in-law, and he surrendered everything to the Lord. And what happened to him was he was thankful that God had done something in his life. And he was he understood for the first time, here's what God really saved him from. And I'm telling you, from that point forward, it changed everything in his life. Changed everything. But if we're like a lot of individuals like Simon the Pharisee or this other demoniac of Gadare. God can change us. He can save us. But if we don't really understand it in our heart, what it was God saved us from, it's not really going to make much of a difference in our life. But when we understand how God rescued us, it'll make all the difference in the world. You'll have a hard time keeping quiet. You'll have a hard time not talking about the things that you love, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. In our story here in Luke chapter 7, we see this Pharisee and this woman, both of them were with Jesus. They both were with Jesus. One felt unworthy to be there. It was the woman who was shedding tears and wiping at Jesus' feet, kissing his feet and wiping his feet with the hairs of her head and anointing him with oil. She felt unworthy to be there. But I can just picture Simon... The Pharisee, as he's laying, they kind of, they usually ate, kind of sitting down sometimes where they would lay down and eat. And it was customary in that day, they would, the table would be close to the floor. But I can see him just kind of casually laying down on some pillows. It's like, what's this woman doing? He was with Jesus, but it didn't make a change in him. 
One appears to be more concerned about what his friends would say. In Luke chapter 7, if you look at verse 49, we don't find this until verse 49 here. It says, And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this to forgive his sins also? He probably had other Pharisee friends there with him. They probably were thinking the same thing he was thinking. He probably was afraid to stand up and do anything. We don't know what he was really thinking because the Bible doesn't tell us. But we do know this. It didn't make a change in his life. The Lord was willing to forgive him just like he was willing to forgive this woman. That's why Jesus told him the story. If there was somebody who owed you 50 days wages, 50 pence, and there was somebody else who owed you 500 days wages, which is almost a year and a half, and you forgave them both completely, which would love you most? He even said, he goes, well, I suppose the one that was forgiven most. And that's when Jesus started explaining to him about what this woman was doing. She understood what she had been forgiven. Do we understand what we have been forgiven? The difference in their actions was simply the response to their forgiveness. Do we love much or do we love little? How are we responding to our sins being forgiven? And the key is simply this. We must realize just how wicked and vile our heart is. It's desperately wicked. And God, in his love and his mercy, chose to save us anyway. He chose to pursue us when we weren't pursuing him. That's the love of God. Oh, there ought to be an outpouring of gratefulness from our heart. And when Jesus says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, we ought to do it with just an overflowing heart and be willing to share our testimony, our personal testimony, whatever it is God has done. And I'm here to tell you again, whether you have a testimony that God saved you from this and this and this, or you just had a testimony where God uh, saved you when you were younger and you were brought up in church your whole life, it doesn't matter if you understand in your heart that if it wasn't for God's grace, it's hard to tell where any of us would end up. And when we are appreciative of that, and we understand that, that is a tremendous testimony. Because we have a tremendous story to tell about the love of God. Let's all stand. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the scriptures. And I pray that, Lord, you will help our love to burn hot for you. Lord, you tell us there about the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2 that they were doing a lot of great things. But the one thing that they did not do is they were guilty of leaving their first love. Just that their love for you just kind of had grown a little bit cold. <laughs> Lord, I pray that you might awaken us, help us to be diligent about our lives, and help us to realize exactly what you have saved us from. Lord, if there's one here who does not know Jesus Christ as the Savior, we pray that they'll get that settled tonight. But Lord, for those of us who are believers, I pray that we will be so grateful. We will be like this demoniac of Gadara, that Lord, we'll just want to spend all of our time with you, we'll want to spend our time at your feet. But, Lord, we know right now we're here in this world. This world is not our home. You're going to prepare a place for us. But you want us to go and tell our friends and tell our neighbors and tell our family members what great things you have done for us. So, Lord, we can have an impact in this world in which we live. Help us, Lord, to do these things. Help us be grateful for these things. Father, we ask and pray you bless now in this invitation time. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. 249, as we sing a few verses, God spoke to you, won't you come? You have a decision you'd like to make, this is the time to do it. You can come pray at the altar, or you can come for some other reason if you'd like to. 249.
Now, I'm one minute early getting done. Can you believe that? Not a name. This is the big one, Elizabeth. <laughs> well, I've got about 10 seconds here. We talk now. We're going to close here in a word of prayer. I thank you for being here. Thank you for being faithful to God's house. And let's be grateful for what God has done in our hearts and lives. Let's love him much because he's worthy of all of that love. Amen. So let's close here in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Dave King if he'd mind dismissing in prayer for us, please. In the Father, we praise you and we thank you for all the blessings of life. We thank you for answering prayers, dear Father, for all you do for us. We take this time to ask you to be with the sick and afflicted of us, Mary Bradley, and many more, dear God, who need special prayer at this time. We ask you to bless and be very near to them. And be with the breeze, dear God, comfort and heal their hearts. Be with the church, Father. Be with the shepherd. Activity in every function, dear God, and every person that works in us, we encourage and bless and take care of them. Be with Walt as he shepherds. Give him all the tools that he needs, dear God, and strengthen and encourage him and help him. We ask you to be with the revival of Preacher John's church, dear God, may that be successful and also be saved and save people. Dear God, 